2016. First of all, I should tell you I'm not an academic thoroughbred. And I grew up in a blue collar family in central New York. Didn't think much about the oceans. Uh, my family was Italian. So I'm more like a cross between Jacques Cousteau and Tony Soprano. <laughs> <laughs> and in that regard, you know, you might appreciate my passion for the sea, but you wouldn't want to see me in a Speedo, I promise you. <laughs> so we'll start with this, uh, the Earth. And uh, I show this for a couple of reasons. One, is it's a powerful image. You know, when you look at that's our planet. Everyone that's lived on this, uh, all of our ancestors lived here. In the future, our children and our children's children will uh, live here. You know, it's our home. And uh, the other thing is we take it for granted. There's a lot of technology and, and brain work went into bringing us that image of Earth. Uh, it's a snapshot. This is a very dynamic planet. It's always changing. Everything changes. The face of the Earth changes. The climate changes. Uh, that's one thing. Two is we take it, we think that because we can see it, we can understand it, and we don't. And part of the reason why is because most of the ocean is that. That's, most of the planet is that, it's ocean. 70% of the Earth is covered with ocean. And this is the Pacific Ocean, so we just rotate the Earth around, take the clouds away, and there you go, it's a big ball of blue. Average depth's about two miles, maybe two and a half miles. And uh, you can't snorkel that deep, you can't scuba dive that deep, you've gotta have technology, and the technology just doesn't exist. We don't have GPS, doesn't work in the ocean. Radio waves don't work in the ocean. There's no light once you get below about 1,000 feet. So all these things that we, I always joke with the space, by people that, friends that work in space, that you can see eternity. In space at the ocean, you can't see your hand in front of your face. From here to Mars, it's one atmosphere difference. And, but, but we go to the bottom of the sea, and it's like thousands of atmospheres different. So the pressure is crushing. So it's in a, and, and as a result, to this date, we've only explored about 8% of the world's ocean, explored meaning go there for the first time, find out what's there for the first time. That doesn't mean understanding. That means just what's there. And that's amazing, because that really means we're living on an unexplored planet. By what I say, when I say we're living on the planet, seven billion people live here. And most of us, about half of us, live uh, uh, right up against the coastline, within about 100 miles of a coastline around the world. So we're really packed against the edges of the continents. And we move back and forth across that ocean. We've had done that forever, you know, some more successful than others, but the oceans have been an obstacle, but they've also been a pathway for human evolution and, and pr progress. It's not a big blue fishbowl. So when we go to the bottom of the ocean, it's not like flat and muddy like a lake. There's a mountain range out there. It's an incredible mountain range. That's the Atlantic Ocean. And right down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, you see it like, like a snake. It looks just, it mimics the North America and Africa, the shape of it does. They fit together along that mountain range. It's all volcanic. It's got thousands of peaks on it, higher than the Rocky Mountains, and, and even the Himalayas. It's got thousands of valleys, many, many times wider and deeper than the Grand Canyon. It's got life there that we never thought would exist there because it's so deep, so dark, so inhospitable. And we find incredible amounts of life, in fact, life that rivals the, the, the uh, tropical rainforest. So we have this amazing thing at the bottom of the sea that it's the most dramatic everything on the planet. There's rivers that run through it, there's underwater lakes, there's underwater waterfalls, and normally, right here, I would uh, bedazzle you with pictures of jellyfish twinkling and all sorts of animals, but I'm not going to do that this time. I want to talk to you about another project that we were involved in that involves everything that I just told you about. So I often get the question, I retired in January, a miserable failure at retirement, so I took a job, I left Woods Hole, took a job at Columbia, but I'm still doing my Woods Hole job and my Columbia job, so. Uh, but people say, where's your favorite place on earth to be? And I always have the same answer, it's the truth, my backyard, my garden, that's where I like to be. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful places on Earth. And one of my favorite things to do is on a summer day, get in my hammock, and uh, when my kids were young, I'd have my two boys with me. And we'd watch in the mid-afternoon all the planes going from North America over to, to Europe. And the convoys of them, plane after plane with the vapor trail uh, out the back. And I would always tell my boys, they're up there seven miles up. That's how deep the ocean gets, seven miles deep. And uh, they would say, and sometimes we'd have binoculars and we'd try to pick out which planes they were, and they'd say, well, Daddy, what, 
if one falls on us. And I would say, no, planes don't fall out of the sky. They just don't. don't, don't we don't need to worry about that. June 1st, 2009, I was in the hammock and my wife came out and said a plane just crashed in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And it was an Air France plane going from Rio to Paris. It was, uh, the, it was Air France Flight 447, 232 people on, on board. And uh, I knew there'd be a search, and, but it was a French plane, and the French are excellent oceanographers. Well, back to Jacques Cousteau, but they were very good at working in the deep sea. And so they, they were out there looking with the Brazilians, and, and they looked for a couple of months and found nothing. And so right away, the media got involved and said, this plane will never be found. And then the government started to echo that. The plane's lost forever. We don't know what happened to the people on board the plane. And so uh, my wife kept saying to me, are you going to get involved? And I kept thinking, no, it's not really our role. And then I started to see the faces of the passengers and hearing the families talk about their loved ones. They want to know what happens to their, what happened to their parents, what happened to my children. And it really started to get to me uh, because we know that mountain range at Woods Hole. We've worked there for decades. And a uh, mountain range, I gave up the next slide. I'll show you in a moment. And uh, so finally, I, I went into Woods Hole. I asked the boss, I said to her, uh, do we want to get involved in this? She said, well, you can try to get involved. So I said, all right, packed my bags, my little laptop. Off I went to Paris uh, to one of the committee meetings and met with the heads of the BEA, that's the French NTSB. And I think they looked at me like I was some three-headed monster because, you know, who is this academic uh, egghead coming here to tell us that they can find the plane better than we can. Well, so that's the track of the plane, Air France Flight 447, and sure enough, it stops right over the top of that underwater mountain range. So here's the thing. It's not only deep water, it's about three miles deep there. It's the same depth as Titanic. But on top of that mountain range, that I said that mountain range is more rugged than the Grand Canyon or the Rocky Mountains. It's more rugged than that. It's not unusual to have mountains that go up and down three miles with landslides and volcanoes erupting and lava pouring out and all sorts of stuff going on. So, it, it was, so when, and when you go there to, to search for something, you're entering an unknown world. We don't know what we're going to find. So to find something that's there, you have to actually go into this unknown world and try to, the realm of Poseidon and try to find this thing. But we were able to make the case that, in fact, we did work in that mountain range for 10 years. The luxury we had over the French team that was looking is that they were forced to go out right away, get out there and find it, and, and they didn't. And we had some time to think about it. There are pieces of the plane found. This is the fin, of course. Uh, the galley, anyone that flies will recognize that, piece of the galley floating around. And all told, we had that. Those are all bits of the plane and sadly some bodies that were floating on the surface of the Atlantic Ocean. They were picked up over a course of a couple weeks. The question is, where did they come from? Because the wind's moving them around, the currents are moving them around, and they're spread out all over the South Atlantic. And so we needed to find the haystack, and more than the haystack, where's the X marks the spot? Lo and behold, uh, there was a committee formulated in France with about 10 people on that committee. Uh, we, knew that the, we knew the last known position of the plane. We knew the plane was airborne for four minutes because it was sending distress calls. It didn't have the latitude where it was, but it said where, you know, these things are strange about the plane. So we had a circle in four minutes, so we drew a, a last location in four minutes, so we were able to draw that circle that you see on the bottom of the ocean. Red, by the way, here is shallow, that's the top of a mountain. Blue is deep, that's about three miles deeper. The modelers said, okay, we know with a, probably 98% sure that that plane is in that box you see in the upper left-hand corner of the circle, 98% sure. So we mobilized our team, out we went, and we had two months to find the plane in year one. So two months we went, the first month went by, didn't find the plane. Second month went by and the pressure started building as the days ticked on, the weeks ticked on. The media started saying, these guys are shams, they're not gonna find the plane. The families were getting very upset, understandably so. The, the countries, Brazil uh, and uh, France, are saying, you know, hey, you know, the modeler said it's there, and you, you haven't found it, what's going on? And then we come down to the last week, and I was sick to my stomach, is mild to say. Uh, it was horrible. The pressure was intense. We didn't find the plane. So uh, luckily, and that was terrible, but luckily after this expedition to try to find the plane, we went to Titanic, where we knew where Titanic was. And with new technology, 
uh, we were able to make the most incredible map of Titanic ever made before in, in history. And we were able to take that back to France and say, look, we're pretty sure that the plane's not in that box. And of course, the modelers got upset. And I asked, we had two modelers that were part of that 10 person committee. And I said, how sure are you guys that that plane is in that box? And they said, well, we're not sure that the, we don't think the plane's in that box. <laughs> I said, well, why did we spend two months looking in the box? And they said, well, it was a committee. And some people thought the plane was over here, and some people thought the plane was over there, so we drew a big box. I said, oh, no. They said, where, well, I said, where do you think the plane is? And they said, we think it's right near the last known position. So uh, we were able, finally, to get the confidence of the families, the confidence of the governments, and go back out here. And with one boat, that's called the Zilusha, and three very new robots that you see there, and I want to tell you right here, if this is not about Dave Gallo. You know, I happen to have the privilege of standing up and sharing this with you. It, the people that are heroes here, like in many cases, are names you never hear. Greg Packard, Mike Purcell, Sylvain Pascoad. People, and, and women, those are guys, are women too, that went out there to sea, that already spent two months out there away from their families in horrible conditions, and now we're about to go out for three more months and spend the, trying to find the plane. Well, no, no, there's no reward at the end of it all. They were doing it because they wanted to help bring some closure and relief to the families. So this is the ship we went out with. We went to that spot, and lo and behold, after about seven days, there was a smudge on the seafloor. That's an image made with sound, but it's very peculiar. You can see it stands out, that little smudge in the middle. It's about six football fields long and one football field wide. And so we told the robots, go back and take a picture of that. And lo and behold, there's the uh, two of the engines and the landing gear of Air, Fl Air France Flight 447. Now, I had just left the ship in Brazil. I was going to take the second of the three months. And uh, I was stopped in Miami and was just pulling in our driveway at home. And my phone rang, and it was the ship, Mike Purcell and the ship, saying, we've been successful. I and I was just about in the same position. I looked up in the sky, and there were the planes uh, going over to um, uh, to Europe again, and it was an incredibly satisfying moment because our, our work, instead of being something esoteric, like what are these mountain ranges doing over the next 100 million years, we were able to help society uh, immediately. So the next thing we did was we uh, wanted to bring back a map because the trick was to find the black boxes. And so this was akin to looking for something the size of two shoe boxes in the Rocky Mountains at night with a flashlight. Not easy to do. So we took 85,000 digital images and made a map that we were able to turn over to the uh, investigators, the BEA, and they sent another ship out. And lo and behold, again, uh, there are the uh, black boxes, the one on the upper left, the two boxes. That's the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder. And the information was still on there after two years, so this was year number two. And so that was amazing to me. And, and we had some discussions after that, that this, you know, they said you'll never find the plane, the plane's lost forever. And mostly when a ship sinks in the deep sea, even today we still say we commit the, the ship or the plane and the souls aboard for eternity to the deep. And now here we are, we've crossed into what we call eternity. So it makes you rethink what eternity might be. Uh, so this was good and it was not a cause for celebration, but it was a moment to reflect on what this means uh, to the insurance companies, to the aircraft manufacturer, Airbus, to Air France, and to mostly to, those, to the survivors, the families of the uh, victims of this air crash. And the thing that made me happy was I thought we educated the, the airline community about how difficult it is to find something at sea and that never again should we allow a plane to crisscross across the ocean without being tracked every minute. Even after a minute, it's difficult to, you know, because they're moving at about 10 miles a minute, and that's a big area to search And when they're talking about that deep and that rugged. And everyone agreed, and then this came along. Malaysian Flight 370 on the way from Kuala Lumpur to Peking. Still missing. This was uh, March 8th, 2014. The team, there's been a team of people out there, three boats. The Australian Transportation Safety Board is running the survey. Uh, the teams have been out there, they're getting the nameless people, about, been out there day and night for two years, and they just came in to wrap up the first, uh, the first part of that survey. Uh, and I know how they feel. They feel horrible. You know, they've been out there all this time because you start to have self-doubt. Did we miss it? 
Uh, did the, maybe the equipment didn't work right. Uh, what do we do next? Where do we look if it's not there? Where's the haystack? And so they're going through all of that now. And the only comfort I can give them is to tell them that the plane didn't leave the planet, most likely. So it's out there. And it's just a matter of regrouping and, uh, and going through all the evidence again, find a new haystack and go look for the sake again of the uh, aircraft manufacturers and the Malaysian Airlines, but also most importantly for the uh, 238 victims, their families and loved ones. Uh, that's where they're looking along that arc. It's, it's, when they're done, it will be the most incredible map ever made in terms of, of area covered uh, on this planet. No one's ever made that kind of a map of, of the seafloor, just an incredible bit of work. Uh, I just did the snapshot yesterday at this time. Just to get, if you've never seen how many planes are in the air, uh, this is called Flight Radar 24. So it gives you a snapshot. And I think uh, at any given time, there's thousands of planes that are crisscrossing the oceans. And in this case, it's morning. So they're coming from Europe to North America. And then the afternoon, it switches back and they head from, from uh, North America back to Europe. It's an incredibly safe mode of transportation, it really is. It's, it's nothing to worry about. In fact, in, in two hours, I'll be hopping on a plane <laughs> back up north. But what I think the important message here is that uh, on this planet, you know, we, we've learned to understand that the ocean is important to us. Uh, sometimes we go there because our curiosity drives us there. We want to know about the life that lives there. We want to know about things like climate change, weather patterns, rainfall patterns, all those things, you know, the oceans give you every other breath of fresh air that you take comes out of the sea. Two billion people on the planet depend on the oceans for food. And um, almost 90% of the rainfall is, is determined by the ocean waters, about where the heat is and humidity is and not. So it behooves us. Uh, and, and so we go because of curiosity, and sometimes we have to go because of a plane like M Malaysian Air 370 or Air France 447, but, and thankfully we can go. Today, no shipwreck or airplane that's lost at sea is beyond our reach, but it's thanks to the ingenuity of people and the dedicated dedication of people that build the robots, that could take those robots out to sea and make them work and are willing to go out there 24 hours a day for months at a time in harm's way to bring back information for us. I'll leave you with a quote from Marcel Proust, and he said that the true voyage of exploration or discovery is not so much in seeking new landscapes, which we do, but in having new eyes. And in this case, technology has given us new eyes to see into the sea and to, for once, actually be able to penetrate into what we used to call eternity. Thank you very much. Thank you.